Landscape holds the key to culture. And the strength of the people of the Andes springs from their relationship to the land. There is no better place to understand that relationship than the ancient city of Machu Picchu. When Machu Picchu was discovered in 1911 by Hiram Bingham, it was famously described as a lost city. In truth, Machu Picchu was always an integral part of the Incan Empire, clearly linked to the entire network of roads that reached back to Cusco and extended for 22,000 kilometers, binding together the longest empire ever forged in the Americas. Built on a strategic spur high above the Urubamba River, it guarded the approaches to the Sacred Valley, while at the same time dominating the eastern lowlands, source of coca, medicinal plants, and shamanic inspiration. But this is just the beginning of the story of Machu Picchu. Some of these buildings are so well made, the foundations are so good and the carvings and so on that we're seeing that it's clear that at least part of the population here, or part of the buildings at least, were used for the Incan nobility. We know that Machu Picchu was designed from the start with a single architectural plan, a plan itself conceived within the framework of Incan cosmology and rooted in ancient notions of sacred geography. Once you get those kind of concepts being built into your head, you come to a place and instead of looking just at the stones, the first thing I do is I look at what's around. And once you have that kind of mindset, uh, frankly, it's not too hard to all of a sudden start to notice that there are these certain alignments taking place. When you climb some trail like this to Wine and Picchu, you begin to get a sense of what it was like to... Whoever designed Machu Picchu would have climbed every peak, built high survey platforms to observe by day and night the position of mountains and the movement of constellations. It's not just like this is sort of a mental Lego kind of game here, an intellectual game, because all of that has its practical consequences because these are the deities that control the climate, fertility of land, livestock. So you get all of that in there, trade, uh, growing of coca, uh, you name it. Anything that's a, a vital part of Inca life is affected by these uh, great mountain deities and, and sacred parts of the landscape. The two most sacred mountains of the Inca were Ausangati, overlooking the valley of the Coyariti, and Salcantay, which is due south of Machu Picchu. The actual Apu of Machu Picchu is Huayna Picchu, the iconic Sugarloaf Peak which dominates the site. The sacred center of Machu Picchu is the Intihuatana, a curious carved stone that was called by Bingham the hitching post of the sun. Johann Reinhardt was the first to notice that the Intihuatana echoed the shape of Huayna Picchu. Yeah, what drew my attention initially was this uh, play of light on the Intihuatana, the stone, exactly replicating the play of light on the uh, Huayna Picchu, the sacred peak that is due north. And the interesting thing here is that the alignment that continues on due south with this carved stone is in the direction of Salcantay, the major sacred peak of the entire region. Johan realized that Huayna Picchu, the Intihuatana, and Salkantai were configured in a perfect north-south alignment. But he also noticed that when the Southern Cross rose to its highest point in the sky, it sat directly over the summit of Salkantai. The Southern Cross, enveloped by the Milky Way, was one of the most important constellations to the Inca. And this revelation brought Johan right back to the Urubamba River, which to the Inca was the earthly equivalent of the Milky Way. Like a serpent, the Urubamba embraces Machu Picchu on its run to the Amazon. 